Okay, guys, welcome. Hopefully everyone's getting comfortable. Um, this is a strange time to be gathering together for one last um, chance to see the Jaggers and to say goodbye. Um, it feels like a little bit bittersweet because we're finally able to, <laughs> to meet in person in this forum and it's to say goodbye. So um, anyway, we just, we, uh, we want this to be a really happy occasion. We're blessing the Jaggers as we send them off to the, this new season of their lives, this new stage. And um, we've been so blessed to have them with us for five years. A little over five years and uh, I don't know about the rest of you I'm sure it's different for everyone but it's gone by so quickly uh, in a lot of ways so it's hard to believe that we're already at this stage saying goodbye so um, just also recognizing like <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of emotions that can be happening in people's hearts and minds so just to acknowledge that it's okay if you want to cry and be sad that's okay um, we also want to just rejoice with the Jaggers too and be happy to send, send them along on the path. So, um, yeah, it is really special that we could do this in person and that we don't have to just do this over Zoom. Uh, it feels like an extra treat. Um, just a couple notes of instructions is that the bathrooms are open if you need to use them. So feel free if you can mask up when you're inside. That would that's kind of what the regulations are right now to wear a mask inside. And there's signage to follow. Um, and I think if you can stay like just with your family unit or you know on your own if you're going into the church building, that would be great. Um, uh, yeah, we're going to start out with. Um, Corey and the team leading us in about four songs. Oh, wait, I'm going to pray first. So you guys, come on up. Come on up. I'm going to pray. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger interposed His precious blood To grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Mightier than the thunder of great waters Mightier than the breakers of the sea It's you who stands firm It's you who is throned in majesty Mightier than the skies that hold the clouds Mightier than the heavens high above It's you who stands firm It's you who is throned in majesty Let's sing this out, oh the seas Oh the seas Lift up their voices And the skies pound their big drums Yeah, the rocks cry out your name And time just 
songs to yourself in your own home those of you who <laughs> may win has been uh, those of you who play instruments maybe have um, but there's something about these songs they've been very obviously written for a group of people to sing together and it's it's one thing to try to do that over zoom but it's just it's been a very long time and it I'm just reminded of that that these really are are intended to be sung by the body when it is assembled you know and so it's just it's it's a real it's a real treat as as julie was saying so, so we're gonna sing uh king of my heart Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Oh, 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 let the 
Let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, He is my song. You are good, good. Oh, 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 you're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Creator. We can't help tonight, I think, but feel uh, that there's kind of a, a uniqueness about the time that we're in right now, just this very second, which is standing on the borderlines between comings and goings and the endings and beginnings of things. And we trust and we know and sometimes we feel that your spirit is here among us. And so uh, tonight as it's out in this space with the suns in our face, with the, the trees behind us and we can hear the red winged blackbirds singing, uh, we acknowledge you uh, tonight. And as we do so, we take a moment to remember that the trees and the rocks beneath our feet and the space has been here long, long before we ever were. And we recognize that you, Father, have been here and your hands have been shaping this place long before we've arrived. And so, Father, we uh, honor this space, honor the fact that we are here, Father, as as your children, and uh, we look to you this evening for our hope. And as, Father, this is the last time that I get to stand up and be a voice in prayer for the sake of this community, I'm reminded, Father, that you 
uh, you give and you take away, and yet your goodness and your, your care and your mercy remains. And tonight I just, I want to offer up just a prayer of healing, Father, and hope and future for the sake of our, our community. Uh, and specifically, Father, I want to be grateful and thankful at the very beginning of it to uh, recognize that you uh, have put Eve and me and this and our family in such a tender community. And you've installed us as their leader and you have for five years. And Father, um, I just want to pray tonight over the church, over the community, that as, as I think about pastoring them for these last five years, Father, I pray that in the ways in which I've done this imperfectly and the ways in which I've hurt your church, your bride, um, Father, I pray that you would come and mend and heal and bind up. And Father, the places where through me you have healed this community, I pray that you would help us to rejoice and um, delight in that. And Father, where I need healing from being the pastor of a community as we all get into our, um, into our relationships and communities, and it's always imperfect. But I know and I pray that you would continue to, to bind up that in me which has been bruised. But Father, I also pray that the ways that this community has healed me and the ways that only it could have and how perfect this church has been for, for me and the, my, my wife and our children. Father, I, I, I want to delight in that and embrace that and um, recognize the healing that they've given us. And so before we are washed once again by the reading of your word, I hand your bride back to you. Um, into your good hands, into your arms, and entrust you with their futures. Pray that you would be with them, Father. Would you um, continue to show and light the way in a time which has been very difficult uh, to be a church, as it has been everywhere. But uh, as we'll hear from the reading today, you are a God of resurrection and life which comes forth in cycles of death and resurrection. So I entrust you, I trust them into your good hands. Father, with faith and with love and with hope, I lift all of these things up, Jesus, in your good name. Amen. Well, how, let me get a good look at you here. You guys can't see me, can you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I get a good look at you. Um, that's a beautiful, beautiful sight this morning or this evening to. Uh, to see you all together and in community. And gosh, what an amazing thing it is to have one little last gift to be together like this and to, to see you guys. So um, I've got a, a sermon today. And um, I know this is it's getting hot out here and um, it's, it's bright. But this is the last time I get to do this with you guys. So I'm going to just take the moment and go for it. And if you or your kids need to get up and walk around or you need to go into your car and turn the AC on or something, you can see the, the, the uh, I think it's 107 point something FM. Uh, this is, I think this, are we recording this? Is it like actual recording? Yeah, that's right. So if something happens and you guys need to, um, and you, you want to hear this later, you can. Or if you don't, that's okay too. Uh, but here we are. So let me get the Bible out here and open her up. So I invite you this evening to imagine for a second that you have never seen a plant. You've never seen uh, a plant in, before in your life. So you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit. Uh, you've never seen a fern. You've never seen a fiddlehead come up. You've never seen a tree or a leaf before. Maybe like perhaps you were born on a spaceship and all you had was like really nutrient rich craft dinner. And that's all you've ever known. Um, and they've engineered it to provide all your needs or something like that. Now someone puts in your hand a seed. 
And let's just say that this is an oak seed. It's a small seed. It fits in your hands. Uh, and maybe it rolls around a little bit when you give it a bounce. And you've never known what could come of this little seed. And then someone comes to you and tries to begin to describe what it would become if only you'd put it in a little soil and feed it and water it. And then you taught your children to do the same thing and they taught their children to do the same thing. And in three or four generations, what comes up out of the seed would be a towering, sprawling mountain of a breathing organism. I think one of the coolest things about creation um, is that not only has God made it to feed us and to sustain us, he also helps us to learn about ourselves and about him through the natural world, if only we would take a moment to ponder how it works. The kingdom of God is like this. It's like the tiniest seed in the garden, which becomes a huge tree that gives shelter to all the birds of the air. So when I think about this parable of Jesus, and when I think about how seeds fall to the ground and they lose their life energy that gave it birth. And then imagine that's when something happens when water hits it and it reanimates it. It sparks a little bit of life in it that's still trapped in there. And the moisture, it brings forth these shoots and out of the ground and it puts down roots and the roots begin to feed the new living organism. And this was all created by our God who is the God of resurrection. And the lesson I, I learned from this personally, if, I'm, um, if, if I think about it long enough, um, is that if I'm going to have any sort of resilient, Jesus-like faith, if my life is going to be marked by joy and abundance in a true way, I'm going to have to walk around in this world with resurrection eyes. If there's any hope of of, of that kind of life waiting for me. Um, if I'm going to stare into the face of this world, which if we're honest with ourselves is full of death, uh, I'm going to have to walk around knowing that the God, our God is a God of resurrection. Now, for those of you who've been around for some time at the church here, you know uh, that all these themes that I've just read out to us and, and mentioned have um, already been at the heartbeat of this church for over a decade. Organic faith, sheltering vulnerability, shaping people who can actually tend to the kingdom of God and not tend in their life towards the lies of the enemy. These themes, all of these themes were part of my original sermon in 2016. I was up here candidating for the role, which is in the pastor's world, your final job interview. You've made it to the last round. And I was uh, preaching on Easter, like no pressure, right? Like what a great, perfect time to really see what the pastor's made of. Um, it's not surprising to me that as I pull that sermon back from, out from the files, which I did, and the last couple of weeks, I find all of these themes running through it. And I remember as I came into the community here and wanted to preach on 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is our text for today, um, I now can see a little bit why God called me here to be with you for these five years as we've lived that out. And so as as I think about it, and I'm, I'm going to try to rehash a little bit of that sermon today just because I'm a sentimental human being and I thought it'd be great. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, but as I, as I look back over the five years and then read through that sermon, it's amazing to see what I can see now having the eyes of history. Um, there's been a lot of celebration. Five Easter's, five Christmases, two hooplas, six weddings, 20 baptisms, and we got a baby out of the whole deal too. That's pretty good. Uh, countless hours of worship, 
and prayer together. 260 Sunday services. God called us here to celebrate together. And I'll never remember, or I'll always remember, uh, the first few months of getting to dance at weddings with you guys. That, that was really special. God also called us here for solidarity, to walk and be together in difficult times, uh, in funerals, in grief, in grappling with the abyss of life. He gave us some conflict that we had to work through, but lots of resolution as well. There was the sharing of minds and the sharing of hearts. And as a church on Sunday mornings, we made it through the book of, are you ready for this? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That was my first year. So, so <laughs> that was a great gift to you, I'm sure, that you, you, you believe that. That was great for me. I loved it. Um, lots of Gospels or lots of time in the Gospels. So many Psalms throughout the year of the Psalms. We've, we've dipped into Romans 5 through 8. Uh, and in, in the summers, we together talk through church and community and creation. And together, we stress the importance over five years of journaling, of praying, of worship. Um, we've launched a strong home group ministry that came in handy this last year uh, through the pan or last year and a half through the pandemic. You've invested in the children and youth of this church, either as group leaders, term leaders, room leaders, uh, building on the legacy of investment into the children of this church that, um, that we've had from the beginning or you've had from the beginning. God has called us out fishing and camping, spiritual fellowship and mission. We have forever changed each other. You have forever changed me and I have forever changed you. And um, it's amazing to me that we end. This is really the, the, the last sermon on a year of preaching through the, the topic of hope. Because that was where 2016 began. Which was my first message on hope. And this is the culmination now. So here is my message then, which is still my message now. It's a great honor to be here candidating with you. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to just read it back out. Uh, and I'm not just, I'm, I'm going to give a few little comments along the way, but I'm not going to preach a sermon at you and then to give comments on it as well. I'm not going to indulge that much. But it was an, a great honor to be here then, and it is now. Uh, Eve and I are from the United States. We, we're currently living in Kentucky, Versailles, Kentucky. And I have here in my notes to make fun of my southern accent. Oh dear, how life comes in circles <laughs> because we're going to the south it's going to come in handy again and next time you hear me eh probably not going to sound like that <laughs> um i wanted to share right off the bat that one of the most formative things in my life that i had done up to this point was getting to travel i got to travel after college to i think it was 23 countries in seven months and that was a great coming to age experience where I got to see a whirlwind picture of, of the world. And there was a lot of flying of airplanes and I'm afraid of flying in airplanes. And that was an amazing time. Um, and the, the trip ended up in a place called uh, the Killing Fields in Cambodia. If you've ever heard of the, uh, the uh, Pol Pot or the Khmer regime in, in Cambodia, there was a genocide in um, in the 70s and early 80s, and uh, there is, what, at this time, the Killing Fields is a monument, a monument in, to those who had been killed in, in the genocide. And um, the monument there is a bit different than we do it here. There was a, um, a, I call it a stupa. It's like a kind of a square, tall tower with a beautiful, ornate roof on it. And in, inside uh, were skulls just stacked on top of each other to, to honor uh, to honor the people who died there. It's kind of, we, we, we wouldn't do that here in the West, but there, there's a, there was a rawness and, uh, and a realness to this, uh, to this, uh, this heritage site. And I remember as a 23-year-old encountering this for the first time, and I couldn't shake it. I mean, I traveled, we traveled on from there and then traveled back into the, the United States, and I couldn't shake the killing fields. I couldn't shake... Cambodia. 
And I think part of the reason is because when you go to different parts of the world, you begin to see really easily the evils that have existed um, elsewhere. But then when you come back home, all the evils that exist here, you begin to see for the first time in ways that you didn't let yourself see. So the genocide, the violence, the ecological ruin, the uh, racism that one sees easily when you go to different places. You come home and you begin seeing it face to face here and you realize, oh, that's us too. And I think the killing fields and the skulls in Cambodia began opening my eyes to these things. Um, there is a scholar named Mario Aguilar who says that God today is currently speaking to his people as he always have, but maybe less and less God is speaking through preachers and more and more through bones. And so um, as we open 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today, we recognize this is where a place where Paul is facing death head on. He's not um, going to shy away in 1 Corinthians 15, away from the topic, um, because he knows that as people of faith, we have to be able to stare unflinchingly into the face of death. As people of faith, we have to be strengthened to stare confidently into the face of death. And so this is what Paul says. He begins chapter 15 this way. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. Man, when I read this, I think, man, he's going for the jugular here. He's not shying away from the hard stuff. He's facing it head on. And uh, if, if Christianity cannot answer some of our questions when we face death, if it cannot begin to answer those kinds of questions, Paul's about to say, it's worthless. Uh, and so, uh, but one of the things that I love about this, this, this gospel that he's uh, declaring here, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve. Our, the, the way that we usually trunk that, truncate that, right? When we want to, well, what's the gospel? And we say, well, Christ died for our sins so that we might go to heaven. That's a shortened version of 1 Corinthians 15, and it's a cheapened version of it. Paul doesn't just stop at die, Jesus dying for our sins and then us going to heaven. It's so much more rich than that. He, he did die according to our sins, and then he was buried, and then he was raised, and then he appeared. That's the full gospel. The whole thing, the whole gamut, the death the burying and the resurrection and all three of those, if we don't live through all three of those and with all three of those, we're missing the glory and power of the gospel. Uh, but then Paul goes on after he talks about these things to like he was feeling unworthy of the gospel. He reminds his readers that he used to persecute and kill Christians and that even to this day, he wrestles or wrestled with what he did. And he had wrestled with feeling unworthy of the gospel. He wrestled with accepting the grace which the Father in his compassion delivers to us. I persecuted, I killed, and I live with that. Um, but Paul is saying, if anyone's unworthy of the gospel, it's me. So if you are struggling with feeling unworthy of the gospel, the grace of God his compassion, remembering that we are dust, washes over us. We are not unworthy 
of the gospel. And then he goes on to talk about, watch out for believing in vain. Watch out for having started well. And in the end, not believing the resurrection because that's possible and that, that trajectory is real. Um, watch out for that. Don't believe in vain. But also he's saying, don't hope in this life. Don't hope in this life. And sometimes in, as Christians, I think we can really mess this one up. Like, don't delight in life. Don't delight in relationships and creation and good food and um, all the things which we love to delight in. This is not what this is talking about. The Lord has created this abundant creation for us to delight in. But he's saying, don't hope in this life. Don't hope in our careers. Don't hope in our bank accounts. Don't hope in our uh, education. Don't hope in our... X, Y, Z, what, what is it that we end up putting our hope in? Have, at the end of the day, false hope, worldly hope, says Paul, ends with this. It has nothing to do with God. It wants nothing to do with God. Um, and if there's this little mantra that comes out of this kind of false, hopeless hope, which is, I'm going to eat and drink and tomorrow we die. You just take that in for a minute. minute. I'm going to eat and I'm going to drink and tomorrow we die. It's this kind of, I've given up. I don't want to fight against the, the difficult parts of life anymore. I don't want to, to run the race of faith anymore. Let's just eat and drink and die. That's not the gospel. That's the world's version of hope. But the future, the future, a, a future-oriented hope. This is where Paul goes. And here in my notes, I have this we. It's Easter Sunday, a day most suited uh, to think about a future hope which doesn't ignore the face of death. The first time I really had to face death in my life was uh, as a 14-year-old boy. I would call myself a boy at that point. I was quite young, and my grandmother had uh, been diagnosed with a form of brain cancer, and she was the rock of our family. She was the one who uh, cooked all the meals at, at, and during the holidays. She was the one at all of the Little League baseball games. She was, she, she grew up mostly deaf in, in, in uh, she had these uh, hearing aids, which were really high powered. And I, I'll always remember, we always used to have these, they had these little flutes in her house and we'd always play the little flutes. And then she'd scream this high pitch, pitch squeal because the, the flutes were setting off the hearing aids and this terrible ringing came into her ears. And then she'd turn them off and then say, okay, go ahead, do, do your thing. Um, Grandma Rosemary, she was a lovely woman and someone who I was very attached to. And I remember one random Sunday evening meal, she was over at our house and she was eating and she couldn't hold her fork. Like the fork kept dropping out of her hands. And she, every, no one really knew what was happening at that point. Um, but she um, kind of looked up sheepishly and I kind of remember the look on her face as if to apologize. Like, I'm so sorry, I can't hold this fork. But she was in her mid 60s and we would find out how she had an aggressive form of brain cancer and uh, they operated and she was then uh, in nursing home in kind of a sedate condition for 14 months. And um, I remember as a kid um, being alongside of her and hoping for a different conclusion. Um, I can remember seeing my father cry for the first time in his life. Uh, and so when she passed, that was my first real encounter with death. And since then, I've learned that in order to be someone of a resilient person, we have to, we can't turn away from that. We can't turn away from looking into the face of death. Uh, Eugene Peterson says that the church is an outpost of heaven in the land of death. Well, if that's the case, if we're in a land of death, well, where do we encounter that? You know, we have the extreme examples of loved ones passing, but where do we, where do we see it around us? Well, it, it, it is, we can see the face of death in, um, in the extreme examples. Um, before I got here, you guys looked into the face of death and uh, it affected you as it affects all of us. Um, you guys mourned the loss of Samuel. You guys lost the 
old, some older men and, and women in the church who had lost their husbands and wives. You lost Adam, you lost Lisa. And while I was here, we lost Gabe and Fran and Eli. And while I was here, many of you lost others of your loved ones. And whether we know it or not, their gifts are here still with us. Their lives are still impacting us. And um, it's something we face. We, we cannot turn away. It would dishonor them. So we face death. And I know it's, it's, it's awkward to talk about this openly. It is, but we, with resurrection eyes, as we learn to live this life with resurrection eyes, we learn to look further beyond that. But also in our lives, we, uh, the, the scriptures talk about spiritual death. We can look all around us and see the impacts of spiritual death. Um, the, the, Paul calls it in Romans 8, the flesh, the things which are raging against God. And then if we are living the cruciform life, if we're living in the way of Jesus, we are denying ourselves and taking up our crosses and, and, and dying on a regular basis. And so there's death around us. What do I mean by us learning to have an unflinching confidence in the face of all of this? Because it's not easy. It's easy to say, okay, I, I'm not afraid of this. I can just look in it. But it's not that, it's not that easy. We, we go through spirals and circles and we nosedive and we soar and we can make real progress, but it's a lifelong journey. What do you think about this? What do you think it looks like to look unflinchingly into the face of death? What does it mean? I think it kind of looks like this. For starters, it looks like when we think about our expiration date, when we think about our future death, which all of us will encounter, we are built up with some preparedness, some peace about that. Thinking about our own death doesn't terrify us. It, we, we take a little bit of a deep breath when we have resurrection eyes. With resurrection eyes, looking into the face of death, we recognize how important our relationships are. And we do everything we can to make sure that our relationships are not strained. Looking into the face of death with confidence spurs us onto an intimate relationship with God. We recognize that life, this life on earth is valuable. And so we make the most of our time. I love Psalm 91. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness. We are people of faith, and our God is a God of resurrection. So we put on those glasses, and we learn to recognize that in seeds, in things which have fallen from the branches, when moisture hits it, it comes back to life. And then Paul wants to say, if you want a little consolation, a little hope, Let's look into the future. Let's peer into the long future of resurrection. And he says in verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. I love this first fruits idea. Jesus is coming back to the natural world to describe something to us again. First fruits, the very thing which, the very uh, first tomato on the stalk, the very first cucumber that shows up uh, is a signal of hope for what's coming in a healthy plant. In a cucumber plant, it's a great crop of cucumbers. In a tomato plant, it's a great crop of tomatoes. So if Jesus died and went into the grave and resurrected and showed up with a body which can walk through doorways and still eat fish. He's the first fruits of what's going to happen to us in the long, in the long term. Paul says, here's what's going to change about us when we are resurrected for life eternal. 
before we could die, we're perishable. But then, after we're resurrected, we're imperishable. We cannot die. And this is where I, I began in 2016 talking about, wouldn't it be amazing to like swim to the bottom of the ocean and not die? And this is where Josiah raised his hand and asked the question. Where are you, Josiah? Okay. <laughs> that was one of my favorite moments if you were there. I'll never forget that. I love that. Um, we were sown perishable, but we will be raised imperishable. Our bodies will not be bodies that will die. We will be able to hang around with ferocious lions, and they may be just as fierce, but our bodies won't be able to die. Just think about what would change. I'm going skydiving tonight without a parachute. That'd be fun. Boom, let nail the ground and start again. We, what, what we were sown right now is perishable, will be raised imperishable. What was sown in dishonor will be raised in glory. What does that mean, sown in dishonor? Did you look in the mirror this morning? How'd you look? Rough? Have you had a haircut since the pandemic started? <laughs> what was sown in dishonor? That means that you and I are, are probably in this culture, all of us, hard at work trying to get the six packs and look like all the Marvel characters. Okay, that might happen on this earth and that'd be amazing. So if I come back here in two years, all stocky, you'll know I've done a good job. But when we're raised, we'll be raised in glory, which means we're going to be the most glorious version of ourselves that possibly could have existed. That's what we're looking forward to in the resurrection. What was sown in weakness. How many people have felt weak recently? You don't have to put your hands up, but I felt weak. What, what was sown in weakness will be raised in power. What will be sown physical will be raised spiritual. And it's important here that you realize that this is not that we're going to be raised as a ghost. What, the, what this is talking about here is that we will be raised, I mean, we won't be breathing H2O, or sorry, oxygen anymore. We won't be breathing oxygen, we'll be breathing the Holy Spirit. That is what will animate us. So we were sown in dust, but we'll be raised in heaven. Paul says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, and this is one of the great verses of all of scripture, I think. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. And that is the greatest news for all of us. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of, in a, of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? <laughs> I just love this because this is coming from Paul, someone who says that he went through two shipwrecks, floated in the ocean twice, who was in the uh, arena with wild beasts fighting for his life and has been lashed a number of times. So this is a man who has been beaten down by life. And in him, upwelling out of him, comes this kind of faith which stares unflinchingly into the face of death and almost tauntingly in the face of death. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? What would it be like for us to inherit that kind of resurrection confidence? So 1 Corinthians 15. This is If you're wanting to learn about what Christians believe about the future, this is a good place to do it. And in a goodbye like this one, um, it's only appropriate, I think, at this point, in Paul's writing to reflect on the resurrected community that which will exist for all of eternity. We say goodbye today. We say goodbye momentarily. And I may be back in a year to visit or if I hate America, I'll be back in a year for good. 
Um, we'll, we'll have time to see one another again, no doubt. But like life together, embodied life together, at this point, we'll be looking forward to that for all of eternity. This will be a foretaste of what will come when everything is put right and healed. The final verse of chapter 15 ends like this. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be steadfast, be immovable, trusting that everything you do in the name of Jesus will not be in vain. Which I love because Paul's just talked about the future. It's really easy for us to think, okay, someday we'll be resurrected. Someday everything will be put right. And uh, let's just kind of hang out until then. But the message is less of that. It's more be steadfast, be immovable. I hope we get all arrested. Wouldn't that be cool? The final thing. <laughs> Confidently in the face of death, people. Okay. Um, but the conclusion of this chapter isn't about waiting. It's not about sitting around. It's about being active. It's about being steadfast, being immo immovable, working for the Lord steadfastly, knowing that what we do in Jesus, nothing's in vain. It will endure. It will persist. And so I think that's some of what I want to close with tonight. I'm sure the last page is here somewhere. It's just all been disheveled. Oh, here it is. So I'd like to give you something you can do about sermons, some practical thing you can do. Um, so I'm gonna, there's about six things one can do to build up their hope with resurrection eyes I have here. Um, but I think I'm going to end with this because I, it's probably the hardest thing for us to do, and I'm preaching to myself here too. Journaling, remembering where we've come from, remembering the faithfulness of the Lord, remembering that in our lives, although we do face death on a daily basis, when we're in the midst of it, it's, it's difficult to remember that resurrection is coming. But if we keep a record of our life, we'll keep a record of the God of the resurrection who works intimately and personally and ongoingly in our life. And so, brothers and sisters, Keith, um, I would invite you in the next little while here, do some journaling. I've already done some, I'm beginning. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be processing these five years, I'm sure for many, many years ahead. Uh, there's so, so much beauty that ha happened here, so much uh, struggle, so much triumph. Um, but as we journal as, and as we read them, uh, we, we recognize that the God of the resurrection is with us. I want to end that with two things. The first thing is a reminder for, for those of you and an introduction for others of you to, to Corey Ten Boom, the book called The Hiding Place. Uh, it's a book about her and her sister Betsy smuggling Jewish men and women into their homes during World War II in Europe, hiding them, protecting them, helping them flee to safety. They eventually get caught, and this is, this is her memoirs. This is her journal that she kept and eventually published of her experience in the concentration camp. Corey was a bit of a hard, she's a beautiful woman, but she testified that she went into the concentration camp a bit, with a bit of a hard heart. Uh, but her sister Betsy was one of those innocent types a purity of soul. Her heart was pure. And they, they happened to smuggle in a Bible into the camp. You couldn't have Bibles in the concentration camp. And so they hid it under one of the cloaks that they were going in as they were initially showered off and brought into the camp. And so they smuggled the scriptures in and eventually they were moved into a barracks, which um, was, I think, five stories high in, in this building of uh, little, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, pallets that you slept on with hay on them. And so you'd cut, like, b think of bunk beds, but sandwiched tighter. And she said that we slept for months and months and months, uh, sandwiched on top of each other in the women's barracks. And the, the winter time was terrible because the people at the tops had the windows and the people at the bottom had no windows. And so um, in the winter time, all of us at the bottom, we were... Um, we were just, it was so hot and we were, they, they were, they were, they were burning up with all the body heat in this barracks, but the people at the top could open the windows and get the cold air to cool them off. And there were fights that erupted in the barracks uh, over this. Well, one of the other terrible things was in the, 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 
hay in the straw that they used as their mattresses, uh, colonies of fleas began to, to grow and hatch. And so as they'd lay in their bed, they'd be bit night after night after night. Terrible situation, just God-awful, a place literally of death. But one day, Betsy decided to do a little Bible study in this woman's barracks after their work day ended. And a few people caught interest in this and then a few more, and then a few more. And eventually they would be having these um, Bible studies with 30, 40 women uh, in, in the barracks at nighttime from all sorts of backgrounds, from all sorts of ethnicities. And sometimes uh, the French women, women couldn't understand the Dutch. And so um, they'd have to, they finally got a translator. And Betsy testifies that the, this little scripture became the light of this barracks. And one day, nearing the end of their, their travail, Betsy, the pure-hearted sister, thought, well, this isn't amazing. How, how did we get away with this? How did we get away with completely turning the experience of this barracks around? The guards should have come in by now and taken this Bible. Um, so she, she went up and asked one of the guards, why don't you come in here and, and stop this? And the guards said, well, we, none of us want to come in there because of the fleas. This is too terrible. We're not going to come in there. And Betsy, in her courageous, Paul-like, audacious, resurrection-eyed mentality said, Corey, thank God for the fleas. And she became thankful for the fleas that allowed them to hold their Bible study. This is what we can become in this life. That's what's possible facing the most difficult scenarios and not unwinding, but facing them with courage. That's what the resurrection can do in our hearts. And so I wonder in the emergence out of the situation we've just been through, I've heard some people talk about it. Has it felt this way worldwide since World War II? As we emerge out of this, I was shopping in Bill's Nursery. I was like wanting to buy some gifts from the, the, the gift shop. And I kept going in. They kept saying, nope, the gift shop's closed. I, I went in there yesterday. First day it was opened. And they had like this 1940s big band music playing. I'm like, it's like World War II is over. And it feels kind of like liberation. Um, so um, what would it look like for us to have this kind of resurrection saturated mentalities? Um, and with that, before I hand this over to what's next, which I don't know, I'm not sure exactly what's, what's next. I, it's, you, you guys have done a great job preparing the service. I, all I've had to do is show up and preach. Um, so whatever's next, prepare yourself because this is the last word. And this, I guess, will be my last word. Don't wait until it's too late to live a life marked by resurrection. Thank you, Keith, for your um, challenging and inspiring words. And I don't want to add too much to take away from what you've said. So, uh, so f yeah, for the rest of the time, we have we have a couple words to be said from a couple different people. Um, we really wanted to not just hear from Keith, but um, to send Keith and Eve and the kids off well, um, and just let them know how much we love them and. Just give them a few memories, maybe. Um, we know probably all of you, <laughs> if we opened up the mic, would be wanting to come and share. Um, so we're sorry if anyone feels like, you know, just circumstances and everything, we haven't had a chance for everyone. But um, we're gonna have um, Amy come up and share on behalf of the staff. And then following Amy Baker, we're gonna have Scott Weeb come up and share as well. So I'll just let those two share and then I'll come up again after that but here comes Amy and thanks Amy wow there's a lot of people here hi everybody um, it's been a real blessing to see you all here tonight I haven't seen this many of our church community together uh, since you know around the beginning of the pandemic time and I put out weekly um, Roots and Shoots videos most weeks and um, 
I feel like a lot of my job these days is output. So it's really, it's such a blessing to see you all here and um, to have so many kids come up to me and say hi and just like obviously like know me and like me and it's just really nice. <laughs> so thanks for, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I wanted to say a few words um, on behalf of the staff. We've had some people come and go and I've kind of been here the longest at this point. So um, I was asked to speak. So it really struck me as I was sitting here listening to Keith to have you speak to us the last time as a community that we're outside in these church grounds because until Keith came, I just was like, oh yeah, it's the swamp and the parking lot. But Keith, like you really nurtured this these grounds. I don't know if people know how many times a week Keith would walk through the grasses here and just you could see him praying over all of you and over our building and sorry I've been fine all week so it was just like to have you here speaking and have the dandelion fluffs in the air and the cool breeze so that it's not too hot like it's a it's a real blessing so um yeah, it's like, it's a really special thing to have your boss also be your friend. Um, I've never had a boss before that has guided me so much. And I think that I can speak for all the staff past and present um, that Keith is someone who cares about mentoring people and guiding them and nurturing them more than he cares about the bottom line. And that's really special to have someone care about your morale every week. We do staff uh, weekly staff meetings, and um, there's been times when we've sat in this building and read through books a chapter at a time together, and then had challenging discussions like the Corey Ten Boom book. Like we read through that as a staff, and it was just really, really nice to have someone who supported our spiritual growth and emotional growth, and just. Um, helped us to become better Christians, help us to become better followers of God. And um, I don't, I, again, I'm not sure if people really know how much Keith has shepherded this community through this last year and a half. Like, it's been a lot. And I know everybody has a lot going on, so sometimes it's hard to see the little things. And I just want to assure you that um, he's done really well. He's done really well and you have earned your gold star and this is kind of a joke with Keith and the staff is he always promises us these gold stars and then he says it's in the mail or something and I haven't gotten my gold star so I don't know it's like I have like a, a mental collection of like all these gold stars lined up but nothing to actually show for it so not sure how to take that but um, I do want to show you that over the last few weeks, we've been putting together a scrapbook from the church community. Um, I asked um, people to contribute thoughts and memories. And I also went through all of our social media and all anything I could think of that would have a photo attached to it. So I've made a book and printed it. And um, I have taken pictures of all the pages and I will post them on social media because of course part of what COVID has taken from us is the chance for us all to crowd around this in the lobby and go through it together and have that moment of you know shared tears and memories and beautiful thoughts. So I will post this and I hope that you can look through and see. Um, I hope it stirs some good memories in all of us and some positive thoughts. And um, yeah, there's a gold star in here for you. And I just really hope that um, you know how treasured you've been from the staff here and uh, for Eve all the work that you've done with gig and with all the other things behind the scenes and supporting your husband as he goes through this crazy role like it's just we really really value you and as we say goodbye like today um, just like to end with how I end all my videos which is I really pray that you feel blessed and you feel seen and you feel cared for so thank you. Thank you, Amy. There's so much more in that personality and chat that isn't 
didn't come out and and uh, I know that Keith there's a lot that was in between the lines there for Keith and uh, it was a uh, so thank you um, I remember clearly the day we brought Keith and Eve up to Thunder Bay it was one of those bluebird skies but it was a spring day that we get in the Northwest it's very common brilliant but a brisk wind coming up off the lake to remind you that Superior still rules the climate around here uh, we had some time to kill in the schedule, and it was up to me to show them around Thunder Bay. I was nervous. Thunder Bay may have a natural playground all around it, but it doesn't rank very high on the list of beautiful cities. I decided to take them over to the Abbey, which at that time was very much a work in progress. There was, in fact, only one portion of the building that was complete, the old bell tower, which had been restored with uh, lovely wooden beams, a stained glass fresco, and a bench for contemplation and prayers. If you haven't been up there, it has a holy feel about it. As we stood there, still very much strangers who had just met hours before, Keith said, I feel I should bless this place, and proceeded to sing an a cappella hymn in Latin all by himself. <laughs> this caused a few feelings in me. One was definitely surprise as my Mennonite roots aren't used to this type of liturgical spontaneity. I looked at Eve for some cues on as if, the, of, if this was normal behavior, but it was a tough read as I looked. She was both tolerating it as well as fully appreciating it. Of course, this feeling of surprise was fleeting as I at once realized that this couple here is used to picking out the pieces of heaven all around them, bowing down and giving the Creator God the space to overlap with this world. In the ugly, in the ordinary, in the tragedy, in the celebrations of life, this pause and acknowledgement of beauty in that tower was a sign of the way that Keith and Eve both allowed God to guide us, their time with us here. I am sure each of you has some memory of a time the Jaggers were present and the curtain of heaven was pulled back to reveal a taste of the living God. Perhaps it was in the prayer, in prayer in the back room, maybe during a small group conversation or an intimate time of loss and grieving. Perhaps it was during the celebrations of the baptisms we had either at the church or at Trowbridge Falls, or during a Sunday morning as Keith invited the spirit of the living God to speak into our hearts. I challenge you as Keith did to take time and reflect on these moments, write them down, Tell someone, make sure these quiet moments don't get drowned out by the noise of life. Perhaps my favorite phrase that I'll remember that Keith included in almost every sermon, but not this one, was that we are to remember that we ourselves are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are loved, we are cherished, and he is never far from anyone Eve's love of our youth is a symbol of how the Jaggers lived this ethos. She saw in them what God sees and strove to build up their sense of wonder and worthy, worthiness at a time of life when worth seems so fleeting and wonder competes with reason. I know that she will most keenly miss seeing how each of our young people grow into beautiful expressions of God's handiwork. I love that Keith had perhaps the longest sets of ser sermon series of all time. Each series took an entire year. Although most of the series, or all of the, most, all of the series, each of them were wonderful. I think it may have enjoyed Moses the most, which is interesting you brought that up this morning. As the story has so much humanity baked in it. So many parallels that are common to our human condition. I got the sense that in the Moses story, Keith also found his calling as a pastor. Our little community, sometimes so wonderful, sometimes so frustrating, we're moving along ever so slowly towards cu true community with a capital C. A community where we shelter the vulnerable, cover each other's needs, and love each other despite our differences. And so now I've been charged with giving a blessing to the Blight Jaggers as they move on from grassroots and Thunder Bay. I'm both, it's a part that I'm both honored and grief-stricken to give because we'll miss them so dearly in so many ways. Keith would often end each Sunday with a version of the uh, blessing of Aaron, 
which was, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Blessings often mark a beginning or an ending or a threshold in life, a new day, a wedding, a birth, a graduation, a baptism, leaving home, a new job, a new church for a journey or a loss, an illness, a death. These blessings are often combined with touch. A blessing is conferred upon us when where we are, but sees us transformed into wholeness in the future through God's favor. It is the deepest form of wish or prayer for someone. The late Catholic priest John O'Donohue says this in his book, Blessing the Space Between Us. A blessing is different from a greeting. It opens a different door in human encounter. One enters into the forecourt of the soul, the source of intimacy and the compass destiny, a state of wholeness, a place where everything becomes clear, where loss will be made good, where blindness will transform into vision, where damage will be made whole. To invoke a blessing is to call some of that wholeness upon a person now. So I'm going to invite the Jagger family up here. If the kids want to come up, they're welcome to. If they're wandering, that's fine as well. Sure. While we're corralling them, um, I thought of Keith. I thought of doing a, a, a something in Latin, or even I found these great Celtic and Scottish ones, and I was thinking of it. But I think in the spirit of grassroots, we're going to do a call and response from the church, not from me, as they bless you. So I want all of you to stand. Oh, maybe you can get closer to I can actually physically uh, hear Keith. There we go. Now, because we can't touch e each other, <laughs> um, I want you in your family groups to hold hands or touch however you're siblings let you. And your response when it's your turn is going to be, we know that God goes with you. God of our life's journeys, we gather here to celebrate the goodness of the Jaggers and to ask your blessing as they continue on the road of life. May the love that is in our hearts be a bond that unites us forever, wherever that may be. May the power of your presence bless this moment of our leave taking. And here's our response. We know that God goes with you. As you journey onward, may you remember that our love and appreciation for you are etched on our hearts. We know that God goes with you. As you experience the pain of change and the insecurity of moving on, May you also experience the blessing of inner growth. We know that God goes with you. As you meet the poor, the pained, the stranger on your way, may you see in each one the face of our Christ. We know that God goes with you. As you walk through the good times and the hard times, may you never lose sight of the shelter of God's loving arms. We know that God goes with you. As you question your decisions and wonder about the fruits of your choices, may the peace of God reign in your heart. We know that God goes with you. We praise you and thank you, God of our journey, for our loved ones who are soon to leave. We entrust them to your loving care, knowing that you are always the faithful traveler and companion on our way. Shelter these loved ones of ours and protect them from all harm and useless anxiety. May the future be a source of many enriching and transforming moments. Amen. So in that vein, <laughs> in that vein, we also have a, a gift that they're going to unwrap in front of us. And it's, I think it, it represents, I know the sun's beaming directly at it, um, but we'll put it somewhere where you can actually see it as well. But it, it represents so much of what grassroots is. Go for it. Yeah, yeah.
You don't, you don't have to worry about wrecking the paper. Do you want to describe it, Keith, or your? We we need a reaction video right now. Yeah. Here's what is your reaction. So this is the the painting at the front of the church with the kind of the key verse of um, the uh, the the parable that I told today uh, at the beginning and um, the the letters. Um, may you can continue to cover the earth with the selfless love of Jesus, which is our. Mission, sheltering vulnerable people, restoring faith, shaping bright disciples. Wow, this is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I'm kind of speechless and stunned. It's beautiful. Wow. I think I, I don't have anything else, but you guys are welcome to go sit down and maybe put it somewhere where the sun can reflect on it. <laughs> Thank you, Amy, and thank you, Scott. Um, we're going to close. We're going to have I'm going to have Rhonda Slaybaugh come up and give one last prayer for the Jaggers, and then um, I th I just need to check with Keith for one sec. Do you still want to drive out and have us honk? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. We were going to um, have the Jaggers drive off and we were going to honk, <laughs> but uh, that was if we were going to be in our vehicles. So we're not going to do that. Um, we'll let them linger a bit and hopefully not too long because we know you have stuff to do as you get ready early in the morning. But yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Um, thank you for sitting in the sun. I know it's been hot and the kids are restless and, you know, everything is a little challenging, but thank you for hanging in there with us. Um, yeah, let, let's just try and remember to try and keep our distances with people as we finish things up. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to say, but now I forgot. Yeah, it's been really nice to be with you all, and um, we just want to send Keith and Eve off. So with no further talking, I'll let Rhonda come up. I, I don't know if Keith and Eve, do you want them to come back up to pray for them? I think. Is that okay with you guys? Do you want to come back up? If you don't have to drag your kids unless you want to, but thanks, Rhonda. This is a real privilege, and um, hopefully I can make it through. Um, but again, I want to echo, it's just a super special, and um, can't think of a better way to send you guys off. So let's pray. Father, we are very grateful to be here together before you. My heart is just full of thankfulness for your presence, for your faithfulness, for your grace for us, Lord. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for the years that we shared with Keith and Eve and Claire, Autumn and Ethan. And our lives are richer because of knowing them and seeing you at work in their lives. Lord, we thank you so much for the beauty of your body the way you've designed it so we are taught and encouraged and challenged and served by each other to your praise and glory, Lord. And Lord, we ask you now to lead and guide the Jaggers as they leave Grassroots and Thunder Bay. Lord, please bless them with peace in transition, with full confidence in your goodness and faithfulness, and for joy in this next chapter, Lord. We bless them in your name. And Lord, I also pray for blessing for all of us who are staying here. I pray that we would remain faithful and keep our eyes on you, Lord. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to, I was, had a little twist on saying the service is ended, go in peace. So your service is ended here, so go in peace. <laughs>